Network segmentation opens a world of possibility for security folks, in theory. But what choice do we have? More than you might think. Stay right here. It's time for TechWise TV. Network segmentation can be complex, but the basics are straightforward. The general idea is to limit the scope of a compromise by compartmentalizing each segment of the network and then controlling communication between them. So how hard can that be? Well, any reasonable segmentation plan must be dynamic because a security zone is not a physical area or even a function. We need controls that can segment at the individual device level and yet still be on guard to trust but verify. Well, today we're going to cover software-defined segmentation, logical, policy-based network security, intelligent responses to threats, security group tags. You know what? 802.1x, not required. We're going to keep it simple because it's the evolution of TrustSec with software-defined segmentation. Kevin Regan joins me in the lab next. Well, Kevin, I'm glad to finally have you in here to talk TrustSec. And uh, this notion of TrustSec versus, or as it relates to software-defined segmentation, what is meant by that? Thank you, Rob. Good to be here. Software-defined segmentation is what we deliver with TrustSec. That's what we oh, enable for customers. Simple. Yep. And so how do you define that? What's the distinction within? Software-defined segmentation to me is enabling much more effective segmentation wherever you want without redesigning the network or reconfiguring your network devices in order to do it. And that's very different to the traditional ways of doing segmentation. Well, I know there's a lot of preconceptions about people that have either worked with TrustSec in the past, because it's been something Cisco's been doing for a long time, and I think a lot of companies couldn't even begin to approach what we have done over the years, but there's been an incredible amount of positive changes, and I want to make sure we get those across here. So I'm going to hold back on the preconceptions for a moment, but I want to address them. But first, walk me through that. So when you say it's this more, and I'm going to make up my own words here, but dynamic way of potentially uh, handling this because it's software defined, what does that actually mean? How is that going to work? It means we take the policies out of the network devices, and that actually means decoupling them from things like IP addresses, VLANs, the things that you connect to. So we do everything based on groups. And if we look at Identity Services Engine, which is the controller for TrustSec, really, you'll find some examples of groups that we've got up here. Now, mm -hmm. some of these are predefined, but really they only use by customers to solve problems that matter to them. So they don't try and create roles for everything that might be potentially on the network. They solve particular security problems for things that matter. So if they're trying to distinguish between employees on managed devices and employees on personal devices will have different groups to take account of those. If they're solving a PCI compliance problem, then you'll find things like auditors, point of sale systems, and a PCI zone in the data center. So these are just examples of groups. And once we've put things into groups, we can then represent policy and how these groups can interact with a very simple matrix in Identity Services Engine. So this looks like something, obviously, it took just a second for it to come up because it's dynamically pulling this defined information and this is what? Is this how you would kind of define relationships? Yeah, this would be how you define how these groups should interact. What should be permissible, what should be not. And if we look at some examples of what my auditors can access, I just need to look at the different protected assets shown in the matrix to determine whether they're able <laughs> to access them or whether they're blocked. Really what customers do with this is they start with things like the crown jewels they're starting to protect. They define groups for what matters. They don't need to fill out everything. We can do this bit by bit. So people can literally grow into TrustSec as they become more comfortable with how this actually works and understanding, wow, we do have the ability to control a lot more, but they don't need to boil the ocean right off the bat. Yeah, they don't. They can okay. add more groups later. They can add more devices later. It doesn't matter how many network devices, how many users you have in your environment the policy matrix would look the same and we can add to it. And the reason that's possible is because we're not reconfiguring things as we do it. All of these policies are downloaded to network devices when they need it on demand. Do we have to be an all Cisco network to do this kind of thing? No. Traditionally, there might have been a heavy dependency on Cisco devices throughout. And we've been submitting protocols to the ITF. We've developed open source components that people can use. 
we've put TrustSec capabilities into some open source SDN controllers, and we've got other vendors implementing TrustSec-based policies. Okay, that's fair. So we're not just saying that we're open, we're actually driving standards, we're actually submitting ways in which others can work with us more effectively, because those are all, when you get right down to it, important pieces of information that we are then able to turn into this policy-based way of deciding what gets access to where in a real dynamic way. Fair to yeah. say? Yeah, and I don't think I can get any more open than open source. Yeah. So it doesn't matter which vendor's kit the user is connected to. If we get regular radius working properly with our identity services engine, I could assign an SGT and I can use that wherever it makes sense. Got it, okay. So it doesn't require only Cisco. I want to ask a little bit about this notion of response actions or what do we do? We decide something's bad. Let's say it's good now, but then maybe behavior changes and it gets bad later. Is that something we can deal with? We have a way of actually reaching out, because that's kind of what we've been known for before, but I think it's more than just a quarantine type of thing, is it not? It is, but quarantine's a good example because we have groups that represent suspicious categories. So with anything that we want to change the policy that applies to, the traditional ways are forcing something into a different VLAN, mm -hmm. it would need to DHCP again, and that's intrusive. What we're doing with TrustSec is effectively changing group membership. So if we have some security sensor talk to Identity Services Engine and tell us about something that appears to be suspicious, we can change the SGT. That might be for more processing, more analysis, or it might be to put a more rigorous policy on it. But we don't have to force it into a different VLAN, change its IP address. This is all transparent to the end host. Got it. Okay, so there's a response actions. To do that kind of thing, of course, you have to be highly accurate, but you guys are taking in data from so many more directions as all centralized through, as you called it, your policy engine, which is the ISE, Identity Services Engine. So kind of looking at my list of myths, uh, as you made me call it now, or the preconceptions, I used to think that TrustSec is something very rigid, it's difficult to work with, that obviously is no longer the case. Certainly not Cisco proprietary, it does sound a lot easier, but one of the big things, or one of the, the I don't want to say dings on it or something, is that I didn't want to get into 802.1x with TrustSec, because that was just a lot of going out and having to touch my devices and have them all at a certain software rev and managing things like this. What is our status when it comes to 802.1x? So .1x is really effective and great where people can use it. And so it's not bad. Organizations use it just by default okay. on wireless. And we can work with .1x in a passive mode of operation with TrustSec by which I mean I just need .1x working in monitor mode for me to put somebody in the right group. What However, does that, what does that mean? We've been working on something that is new that we call passive identity. So this is a okay. new approach that allows us to do things without a dependency on .1x. If I take a common or garden managed asset, so something that's known in a corporate active directory, for instance, we need to make sure that once the user device logs in, we actually extract information from AD. So this is something that we can set up. So we share event data with Identity Services Engine. So this tells me about the user, mm -hmm. Rob, and your IP address. With regular radius functions, I can send similar information about your IP address yeah. and where you are on the network to Identity Services Engine. Okay. And Identity Services Engine can correlate these two bits of info. So now, this can create an SGT just based on that information we've extracted mm -hmm. without really any dependency on the end host. We don't need a supplicant, we don't need an agent to do that. So once ICE has got a security group tag value for your IP address, that could be shared with firewalls that might be okay. from Cisco or from other vendors somewhere in the path of the network. It could be shared with other devices that understand TrustSec and this could be some enforcement point somewhere in the network. And if my access layer switch ideally comes from Cisco and understands SGTs, we'll pass that information back to the access layer switch. So we can be implementing policy based on these security groups anywhere in the network. Interesting. So we still recommend 802.1x because it's a very good security method, and it sounds like this is something we could use in conjunction with it. It's not an either or proposition, but something new enters the network, the first thing it's going to be forced to do is check in with Active Directory. Based on its status from Active Directory, we're going to correlate that with yep. where it's coming in from and then base a security group tag on that. They'll then travel with that and it becomes its identity to then say, if they're behaving well, then they get the access that they're allowed to based on the group that they're in. Yes. And no and more, no less. And once we've done that with passive identity, all we don't want X, our enforcement points, once they become aware of this, pull down policies they need from ICE. This sounds so like it would be lighter on the network as well. You're not having to pre-populate a ton of stuff. Yeah, when 
devices are enforcing policy, they just pull down elements of the matrix that they need. Okay. So I might have a very busy set of rules describing what's happening for thousands of users, but a given device may only need a very small proportion of that. So that's an important characteristic of, of what we call software-defined segmentation, just pulling down the parts of the matrix that are required when you need so for minimal impact on demand. What you need, when you need it, and not a moment sooner or later. Okay, I like okay. that a lot. Which actually brings up just a couple of final points, this notion that you'd mentioned to me that secure group tags are for things beyond security, because once you've got this working, which doesn't sound hard to get started with, now all of a sudden you can do other stuff as well? Yeah, I could make a routing decision. I could apply a QAS policy on some routers based on the SGT. That might be for security reasons, like handling infected stuff, or it might be for some completely different use cases too. All right, final point, because you didn't want me to get out without asking about this, but ACI. So a lot of customers are looking at enabling ACI within their data centers. This is a more policy-based way of doing network architecture. Are we working in conjunction with this? We absolutely are. So ACI is using groups within next-gen data centers to describe how applications can interact or not. And we do two major things with ACI now. So TrustSec ACI integration means if a customer is using ACI in their future data centers, they'll classify servers with an endpoint group, and we retrieve information so we can automatically use that uh -huh. in our TrustSec domain if we want to. And if that customer is writing security policies in their ACI environment, and the business problem they're trying to solve requires them to understand things from outside the data center, like my auditors or my ATMs mm. or some medical device. We can push information about our security groups into ACI, so all of this group information becomes available in the ACI policy, and we enable consistent groups across the whole enterprise. I think the notion of TrustSec, and especially in conjunction with ICE being that policy engine, I don't know any other way this type of thing could be taken care of across the entire network like this. I think we're still doing something really unique here. Kevin, thank you, thank you so very much. much. I appreciate that time. Hey guys, one of the biggest values you could get out of this particular show is the workshop. We do a workshop with just about every one of them. You can look below the video to find a link, hopefully to the live version, where you get a chance to interact with some of the same experts that we use on the show and cover the topic in much, much more detail. It's incredible value, and in case you missed one, you can always go to the archive at techwisetv.com, look them up there, and you won't want to miss it. It's good stuff. Check out the workshops, techwisetv.com. See you there. TrustSec can be that long arm of the law, right? The literal network as the enforcer. Now combine TrustSec with the Identity Services Engine and get that key single source of truth, something that everyone should be doing. Because security is a moving target, but you can now harness the power of your network and start doing something with all of that data that you're already generating. So much good stuff to cover with this policy management series. Make sure that you don't miss any of it. Plus, join us for the workshop, we're going to take your questions live as we dive even deeper. Because that's it for today. I will put all of the kinds of resources up in the show notes at blog.techwisetv.com. You can follow me on Twitter. Updates, insights, funny jokes, maybe. You should also follow the show, too, of course. And with all of that, if you can only remember one thing, it's the URL techwisetv.com. All the shows, including this one, can be found right there. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you online.